All right. So let me begin with an illustration here. Uh, Chuck Colson tells of speaking on the campus of a secular university. He was talking about his commitment to Christ and he mentioned that he was willing, if necessary, to die on behalf of his savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. A young man in the crowd angrily interrupted, shouting, Come on, Colson, nothing is worth dying for. Nothing is worth dying for. Chuck Colson paused for a moment. He looked at him with love and then he replied, If there is nothing you're willing to die for, then I submit you have nothing to live for. Did you hear that? If there is nothing you're willing to die for, then I submit, he said, you have nothing to live for. Commitment, a total devotion, not mere interest. And by the way, there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in doing something, you do it only when circumstances permit. When you're committed to doing something, you accept no excuses at all in doing it. And you put your heart and your soul into doing it. Commitment. Total commitment. That's what Moses is calling Israel to do or to make as they're about to conquer the promised land. He is asking them for a wholehearted commitment to Yahweh. Now hold the thought at the back of your minds and let me introduce the book of Deuteronomy to you here. Then we'll get back to what we were talking about. The book of Deuteronomy opens with a five verse introduction that establishes the historical and geographical basis for the rest of the book. It establishes the historical and geographical foundations for the rest of the book. You have the verses on the slide here and I will read the five verses for you in their entirety. Please follow along and we will see uh, how they form the foundation for this entire book. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah opposite Sup, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazeroth and Bizahab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb. And by the way, Horeb means here Mount Sinai. In the book of Deuteronomy, only once it is called Mount Sinai. The rest of the times it's called Horeb. Okay, so from Horeb, by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and in Edre, beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law. We'll move to the next slide, please. And let me explain these verses for you very briefly. The book of Deuteronomy is a series of three speeches that Moses delivered on the plains of Moab. 40 years after the Exodus. And on the slide, there's a map. Uh, it may not be accurate because some of the places are unknown even to scholars. They're not sure about it. But the plains of Moab is marked for us there on the slide. Okay, so these are three speeches that Moses delivered on the plains of Moab 40 years after the Exodus. Now notice verse 2 that we just read. Verse 2 here very subtly reminds us of the consequences of sin and rebellion. It states that the trip from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, and Kadesh Barnea is marked there on the map, and uh, it is almost on the edge of the promised land. So the verse says that the trip from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea was only an 11 day journey. The reference to 11 days is a vivid reminder to Israel that a journey that should have taken them 11 days has already lasted 40 years. Rebellion has delayed the realization of the promise until the 40th year after the exodus from Egypt. Now, a generation later, Israel was finally in the plains of Moab, ready to cross the river Jordan and claim the inheritance that God had promised them. It was time then for the covenant of Sinai 
to become the covenant of Moab as well. Now, when you look at verse 5, the last verse of the introduction that we read, we see that the introduction closes with a statement that Moses began to explain this law to Israel. Moses began to explain this law to Israel. So Moses, mindful of the fact that he's been barred from entering the land, begins his final three addresses. Next slide, please. The English title Deuteronomy is taken from the Greek translation of Deuteronomy 17, 18, and the verse is there for you. This verse speaks of the king writing for himself a copy of the law. The Hebrew phrase, a copy of the law, was actually mistranslated into Greek as Deuteronomion. Deutero means second. Nomion comes from uh, nomos, which means law in Greek. So Deuteronomion means second law or a repetition of the law. But Deuteronomy as a book is more than a restatement of the covenant and the laws given in Exodus and Numbers. It is actually an exposition of the covenant in a new setting. It would be more accurate to say, based on the original Hebrew text, that it is a renewal of the covenant made at Mount Sinai with Moses. The Sinai generation was largely off the scene, and the new generation that was about to conquer the land of Canaan needed covenant reiteration and covenant reaffirmation. That's a brief introduction to the book of Deuteronomy. We'll move to the next slide and ask this question. Why was the book of Deuteronomy written? Why was the book of Deuteronomy written? Now, you could list several purposes for this, but I want to highlight for us, for our understanding, two major purposes of the book of Deuteronomy. The first thing, with regard to Israel's divine calling, let me trace the story from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy, the entire Pentateuch, because we have the closing of Pentateuch. This is the end book the fifth book written by Moses, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So the book of Genesis introduces us to the patriarchal roots of the nation of Israel, the covenant that Yahweh established with the descendants of Abraham. Remember land, seed, and blessing that uh, Sujay talked about? Then you come to the book of Exodus, and it depicts for us Israel's transition from a people to a nation a nation to whom God gave his law. Their sincere obedience to that law was central to fulfilling their God-given calling. What was their God-given calling? It was to represent God's character before the pagan nations of the world. We come to the book of Leviticus then that details how the nation could have access to and live before a holy God. And then the book of Numbers describes Israel's journey towards the land of promise. The rebellion at Kadesh Barnea occasioned divine judgment, which is why they wandered about in the wilderness for almost 40 years until a whole generation was wiped out. The book of Deuteronomy then, as we come to it, depicts God's people camped on the plains of Moab. They were faced with a significant challenge of expelling the Canaanites from their land. And so, the Israelites needed this reminder of their God-given identity. Moses reiterates the covenant established at Sinai by applying it directly to this new generation. Now, the Canaanites who were before them were a vile and idolatrous people. Once the Israelites crossed the river Jordan, they would not only face a military challenge, but they would also encounter temptations to compromise their conduct as God's chosen people. The book of Deuteronomy reminds Israel of who they are, where they originated, and explains what God intends for them in the promised land in the coming years. And that's the first purpose of the book of Deuteronomy. Secondly, the role of Moses in the institution of the covenant at Sinai had been so significant that many Israelites thought Moses and the covenant were inseparable their minds, Moses and the covenant, must have at least seemed inseparable. Now, as the time approached for Israel's entrance into Canaan, the time of Moses' departure, that is his death, 
was also nearing. To be sure, God was the true leader of the covenant people, but Moses had been the divinely appointed covenant mediator. The children of Israel would soon have to face life without Moses, and they have to switch their full allegiance to another leader, Joshua. The book of Deuteronomy prepares God's people for this transition, for this change. It helps to demonstrate the continuity between the leadership of Moses and the leadership of Joshua. So these are the two major purposes that I want to highlight for the book of Deuteronomy as we move further. What are the contents of the book of Deuteronomy or what is the overview of the book of Deuteronomy? Now, before I uh, get into the context in which the Shema appears and what it means to Israel or what it meant to Israel, what it means to us today, I want to give us an overview of the book of Deuteronomy just in a couple of minutes. The book actually contains, like I said earlier, three lengthy speeches of Moses intended to exhort the Israelites to keep the covenant faithfully. These speeches survey God's saving acts on behalf of the previous generation and they summarize the laws of the covenant in order to prepare the new generation of Israelites for the future in the promised land. So the first speech of Moses and the references given there it recounts God's mighty acts on Israel's behalf for the time from the time of the covenant at Sinai to this renewal ceremony in Moab. So Moses is recounting all of God's mighty acts from the time of the covenant at Sinai to this renewal ceremony in Moab. Moses wanted to teach about God's nature as savior. Yahweh by nature is a savior. Yahweh by nature is a protector. And he wanted to remind them of these truths about God in order to motivate the Israelites to keep the covenant faithfully. The second speech of Moses restates the covenant laws originally presented for us in Exodus chapters 20 through 23. The Ten Commandments needed to be applied specifically to the lives of the Israelites in the promised land instead of their wilderness lives. Earlier it was given in the wilderness, it was applied there, and now the same Ten Commandments had to be reapplied specifically to their life here and their life beyond the River Jordan in the promised land. The third speech is the final speech of Moses to the nation. He begins with a ritual of curses and blessings dependent on uh, covenant obedience. And then he charges the nation to be faithful in the future, even after his death. And then he formally commissions Joshua as a successor. The book closes with three supplements. Chapter 32 is a song of Moses. Chapter 33 is a blessing of Moses and chapter 34 is a death and burial of Moses. So that's the entire book of Deuteronomy for us in about three minutes. Now, what are the major themes of the book of Deuteronomy? Or in other words, what are the major lessons in the book of Deuteronomy? And I wanna bring out two lessons here and which is where we get into the heart of the matter. Deuteronomy is a treasure chest of theological concepts that have influenced the thought and life of the ancient Israelites and even the church. Its centrality in Old Testament thought and its influence on the New Testament church cannot be exaggerated. But I wanna bring about just two lessons here for our understanding this morning uh, from the entire book of Deuteronomy. The first lesson that we learn that Moses talked about in his speeches is about the uniqueness of Yahweh. It's about the uniqueness of Yahweh. Uh, if you can move forward, please, uh, Ajit, I have the verse there, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. More literally, the Hebrew idea is this, the Lord our God, the Lord one. This is the Shema, the creed of Israel. And the opening words uh, have been used as its Jewish name, and it's called the Shema. What does the Shema teach here? Don't go there yet. Uh, I, I just, I'll come back to it. Uh, what does the Shema teach? It teaches that Yahweh is totally unique, one in essence, and that he alone is God. 
he is unlike any other deity. To the Israelites, there are no other gods. They are nothing. The concept being taught here is called monotheism. Monotheism. And the creed here sets forth the unity and the uniqueness of Yahweh, the God of Israel. When Yahweh demonstrated his majesty by thunder and lightning, trumpet and smoke at Sinai, if you remember, he taught the Israelites a special fear and a special awe. So much so that they wanted no more of it. They were not to think of Yahweh as just another God, like the gods of the nations around them. No, Yahweh is unique. He owns the whole earth. Pagan neighbors that, surround, that surrounded Israel believed in polytheism. These gods were always warring with one another. Each pagan god was unpredictable and morally inconsistent. So the average pagan never knew which side to be on and therefore he quickly changed gods to avoid their wrath. Israel on the other hand believed in only one God who dealt with them with a consistent righteous standard contained in the Mosaic law. If we were to go back to their history, Israel ha had learned this lesson during their deliverance from Egypt. The children of Israel had discovered that the Egyptian deities were nothing. They were powerless. They were hopeless. There was nothing in Egypt with which to compare Yahweh. They had come into the presence of the living Lord. He was a reality to them. To him alone belongs the name Yahweh. He is the one absolute God. There was none like him. When he spoke, there was none to challenge him. When he made a pledge, there was none to cancel him. When he brought about judgment on his own people, there was no other refuge for them. He is unique, the one and only omnipotent sovereign Lord. Now that's the concept that Moses presents here in the Shema as they're about to cross the river Jordan and get into the promised land because that is their land of inheritance. Now I want to draw here, there are many strands that go from here all the way into the New Testament. Many strands that go from here all the way into the New Testament and they end up in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to point out one strand here and listen to me very carefully, please. Uh, Ajit, can you go forward, please? Now, when you look at the verse that's on the slide here, Deuteronomy speaks of a day when God would raise up a prophet like Moses. That is Deuteronomy, that is Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15 specifically, but you can look at the whole context from verses 14 through 22. So it speaks of the fact that God would raise up a prophet like Moses. Now, when the book ends in Deuteronomy 34, we'll move forward. It ends by saying that there had never been a prophet like Moses. So firstly, in chapter 18, God would raise up a prophet like Moses. But in chapter 34, as the book ends, there had never been a prophet like Moses. So a simple syllogism was, was done by Jewish interpreters. And we'll move ahead on the slide. This is what they said. Number one, God will raise up a prophet like Moses. Number two, there has not been a prophet like Moses. Chapter 34. Therefore, they concluded, we must keep looking for such a prophet. We must keep looking for such a prophet. So this syllogism formed the background for much of the speculation among the Jews as they encountered John the Baptist and Jesus, both of them. If you remember, when they encountered John the Baptist, they asked him the question, John 1, 21, are you the prophet? Now, when Jesus had fed them with bread and meat, just as Moses had done in the wilderness, they thought he must be the prophet who would do the signs and the wonders that Moses had done. When Jesus promised an unfailing stream of life-giving water, the crowd remembered the miracles of Moses in the wilderness and the promise of a prophet who would perform such deeds, John chapter 7. But the same gospel clears up the uncertainty. Next slide, please. If you look at John chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, right at the beginning of it, the gospel says this. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side or the Father's bosom has made him known. Hear me, please. Moses the servant of God 
cannot compete with Jesus, the unique Son of God. Moses, who spoke with God directly, had not seen God fully. Yet the Son, who was in the beginning with God and was God, has truly revealed the Father. He is the Word, the revelation of God. And that's why Jesus could say in John 14, 9, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So when Jesus insisted that he and the Father are one in John 10, it should be understood against the backdrop of the great central confession of the Israelites' faith in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's the first lesson that we learn uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, which is the uniqueness of Yahweh. There's a second lesson that we learn, and Moses asked the Israelites to pursue total devotion to Yahweh. He asked them to pursue total devotion to Yahweh. The uniqueness of Yahweh calls for a specific response from the Israelites and from all of us listening to this this morning. Number one, because Yahweh has no outer form, making images to worship him is forbidden. Number two, because Yahweh is the only true God, they must commit themselves totally to him. And I'll talk more about this. Number three, because Yahweh is a jealous God, they must avoid worshipping other gods alongside Yahweh. Yahweh will not be worshipped as one of many. He is unique. He alone is God. Fourthly, because Yahweh is a God who speaks and answers prayers, Israel has the opportunity to be unique among the nations in wisdom, in understanding, and in greatness. Number five, Yahweh fights uniquely for Israel. And so, when confronting her enemies, Israel must destroy not only the people, but also the images of their gods. This is a response that Moses was urging them for. Now, when we look at Deuteronomy 6, 5, he's, he's summarizing all of that in one verse. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. You see, in verse 4, Moses proclaims Yahweh's uniqueness. He is one. He is indivisible. He is unlike any other. And because he is unlike any other, the consequence is in verse 5. The Israelites are to love God and God alone. There can be no aspects of the aspect of their lives that is not to be brought under God. Their love of God is to be all-encompassing and all-consuming. There can be no conflict between the inward life of God's people and the outward signs of that life. Mind you, this isn't simple rule-keeping. It's all of life in response to the Lord their God of the covenant, their savior, their redeemer and provider. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ was asked by a lawyer this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. Now, that wouldn't have surprised the lawyer, but he followed it up with a second one, and he said this, and, this, and the second is like it. You shall, love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, here's the point. If you love God with your whole being, your soul, mind, and strength, then it seems that you cannot help, I cannot help, but start to see others as God sees them. Love for others reflects the love shown by God to his people. So those are the two major lessons of themes that we learn from the book of Deuteronomy. Number one is the total uniqueness of Yahweh. Number two, that the Israelites must pursue total devotion to Yahweh. Now, how do we apply the message of Deuteronomy to our lives? I want to bring in three specific applications for us. And again, there could be many applications, but I want to bring in three specific ones for our lives today. Number one, God calls us to understand who he is. God calls you this morning to understand who he is. God calls me to understand who he is. 
The question is still relevant today. Uh, no, Ajit, I'll come back to this later. The question is still relevant today. That was asked long back by the ancient Israelites. What does God want from us? The answer is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Here is the heart of what God wants from us. He wants us to understand who God is as he has revealed himself in the person of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In a world with hundreds of competing gods, God asserts his exclusive identity as the only true God. He is incomparable. As he says a little earlier in Deuteronomy about his saving acts, in Deuteronomy 4.35, he said this to the Israelites, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God, there is no other besides him. This was true when God rescued them from Egypt. Imagine how much truer this is for us who know more of God. For those of us who have not just been redeemed from slavery or rescued from mere slavery, but have been rescued from sin and death, God has saved us and rescued us so that we may know that the Lord is God and there is no one else like him. Even today, there are many competing gods that demand your loyalty and my loyalty. False gods are always ready to invade our minds, our homes. The gods of materialism, fame, fortune, popularity, power, greed, immorality, drugs, even ministry. They're always vying for our attention. How do you live the Christian life in such a pagan world? It is by first understanding that God has no rivals. There is no one else like him. He is one and he is unique. You can click uh, Ajit and come to the next point. Let me ask you these questions sincerely as I ask myself these questions. Do you have a relationship with this God that we've been talking about? Is he your God? Is he the God of your family? What do you know about him? What do I know about him? God calls us to understand who he is. Application number two. God wants our total devotion, loyalty, and love. God wants our total devotion, loyalty, and love. If Jesus is who he says he is, then there is no other option. He is worthy of all of our love. It makes sense that we should love him wholeheartedly in light of who he is and what he's done for us. This is the heart of what the Christian faith is all about. And the most important fact that you and I can know about God is this. Jesus is God. There is nobody else like him. Nothing else comes anywhere close to deserving our loyalty, love and adoration. And by the way, there are no limits on loving God. You can never say, and I can never say, that we have loved God enough. Loving him completely will change every part of our lives, our relationships, our careers, our money, the way we look at things outside, our sexuality, and everything else as well. I just want to remind all of us that love grows through a deepening understanding, a better knowledge of the other person, his thoughts and his actions. And then expressing through verbalization that new discovery. For example, if I were to talk about Angela and I, I observe her, I see her actions, and I understand her love through her actions, and I verbalize the discoveries that I find about her. For example, I could say, I love you because you cook well for me. That's a discovery about her. I love the way you take care of me. What are your concrete reasons? What are my concrete reasons for loving Jesus? Concrete reasons for love increase the feelings. Making new discoveries about the person adds to the content of the love. Love will grow as reasons for love are discovered more and more. Love will grow as reasons are thought about, expressed verbally, 
and they are also remembered. And that's why you and I must read God's word, write it down, memorize it, speak it out by sharing with our family and friends and colleagues, and you and I will grow in our love for him. Because God wants our total devotion, loyalty, and commitment, and love. Thirdly and lastly, we may be in danger of forgetting God. We may be in danger of forgetting God. I love the realism of this passage. It gets to the heart of our problem as human beings. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12 with me, please. That will be on the slide in a moment. Let me read those verses for you. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, and notice here, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Here's the reality about us, and hear me please. We've already seen that God has no rivals. There is no other God like him. Nobody else is worthy of our worship. You know which is one of the biggest rivals to God in our hearts? It is not Krishna. It is not Allah or some other deity that doesn't really exist. The greatest rival to God in our hearts is his gifts. It's the cities, the houses full of good things the food, the cars that we drive, the good life. And Moses warns the people, the greatest danger to their souls is that they will love the gifts of God more than they will love God himself. They will love the gifts of God more than they will love God himself. It is possible for our souls, my dear brothers and sisters, to be so satisfied with the gifts of God that we have no hunger left for God himself, the one for whom our souls have been created. John Piper says this, and there's a long quote, and I want you all to pay attention, please. The greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night. For all the ill that Satan can do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet table of his love, it's a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a wife. The greatest adversary of love to God is not his enemies, but his gifts. And there's a context in which he's saying this. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. Did you hear the last statement? For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. The good life can become a deadly substitute, substitute for God. The greatest threats to your soul are probably not bad things, but good things, because those good things can take the place of God in your life and in my life. Next slide, please. So what will help us know and love God despite all the distractions? The answer is given to us in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. Can you move forward, please, Ajit? And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We are to take this commitment to God and allow it to permeate all of our lives. And if Ajit can move forward, I'll, I'll let you notice the concentric circles from moving, uh, uh, concentric circles moving from inside 
to out. First is our hearts. Notice what I command you shall be on your heart. And then it's our households. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit, sit in your house, when you walk by the way and things like that. And then it goes out to the public. Public declarations of our faith in God as signs on our hands and frontlets between our eyes and writing on the doorposts of our houses and things like that. Moses called the people to remember by constant repetition and weaving their faith and trust into every part of their lives. To know God and to love God means that we take a repeated action to integrate that knowledge and love into every part of our lives, private lives, family lives, and public lives. And there are certain actions that we can take that will help. I don't want to legislate any actions for you. You know what they are. I know what they are. But God's call on your life and my life is to know him and love him. You, like every other human being, and I, like every other human being, are in danger of forgetting God. The solution is to develop habits, repeated actions that keep your love and my love for God at the center of every part of our lives. In other words, repeated habits are crucial when it comes to following Jesus. So let me ask you this question in closing as I ask myself the same question. What repeated actions can you take in your life to cultivate the knowledge and love of God in your life? Know God and love God by building godly, biblical, healthy Christian habits. That will help us know and love God. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Ajit, especially for helping me navigate through the slides. And may the Lord bless you all for your patience. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this morning. We want to thank you for speaking to us from the book of Deuteronomy, the book that was written centuries ago, Lord, by your servant Moses. But we saw this morning that it is as relevant to us as this morning's newspaper, because our hearts, the human hearts are still the same. We have the same problems. Thank you for helping us understand this morning about the uniqueness of Yahweh, that he is unique, he is one, he is indivisible, he is incomparable, there is no peer for him. Thank you, Lord, that our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, came down in the form of man, and he exegeted, manifested who that God is. And when we come to Jesus, we actually come to this very God that we've been talking about. We want to thank you, O Lord, that in the person of his Son, we see God in the flesh. We also want to thank you for the reminder that we must pursue total devotion to Jesus. Help us all, O Lord, enable us all not to be distracted, not to be waylaid by the things of the world, but always to pursue that love of God and the knowledge of God to love you more and more, to worship you, to fall down and to fall down prostrate before you, O Lord, all the days of our lives, by developing habits that are healthy, that will remind us on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, who you are, and that we need to be committed to you. We want to thank you, O Lord, that you gave us this time to meditate on your word. Help us to apply all of these things into our lives. We also pray for the rest of the uh, the rest of the service, the second meeting especially, we pray for your blessing upon it. May your name be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.